icy wind shook the solitary warrior, sealing his fresh wine-red lacerations with a thin coat of frozen blood. Battle scars were earned on these grounds of slaughter. But his weary eyes began to close as his arduous journey came to an end, and his final adversary lay lifeless beneath his feet. Silvery beams of moonlight began lulling him closer to his own final moments awake. The warrior stole his final breath, and his cold, stained blade fell before him. He saw one final vision with what eyesight he had left. A bright red burst of light, engulfed in a warm flame, illuminating the night sky. The fiery song of the dying bird filled the silent night heavens with its last remaining notes. And the phoenix began to fall. The child's eyes stayed unresponsive, like nothing happened. The deafening discharge had led a path of death straight to the cluster of blood and feathers that fluttered down towards the ground, turning life into corpse. Not another one, the child pleaded under his breath, but silent pleas go unheard still. Go get him, Orly, Samson commanded, smacking the dog with the butt of his shotgun, which was soon to be reloaded. The old hound followed the musty odor to the still-twitching husk of what had just left an imprint of scarlet on the dirt beneath. A life full of flight, full of freedom, belittled to an old man's game. Adding to the mounting pile that lay less than a meter away from Samson's youngest son of eleven. Stephen stood still even then, hushed, unwavering. He had gotten quite good at tuning out all this. However, the sight of that slowly growing corpse mound in front of him was full of threatening fright. A fourth dead bird and still not enough? <laughs> Stephen's father chuckled through a lip of tobacco. Good boy, Oral. Lucky day, ain't it? The 52-year-old bearded man slid the barrel forth, metal against metal like nails on a chalkboard, but not fingernails made of hard human protein, but metal nails used to drive two boards of wood into one, and not chalkboard made of slated stone, no. A rough, rusted wall of hard sheet metal. A sound no kid should have to hear this close. And yet, the man was still eager to add a few more to the massacre. Hope you're learning something, kid. His father remarked, accent stronger than ever before as another vulnerable target dashed into the air just over the wheated horizon. Another deafening explosion of powder and smoke ushered in relentless doom from the barrel of Samson's 12-gauge and deep into the tiny heart of some unknown bird probably Goose. Stephen just stood, only watching, securing what silence he could to let his inner imagination take over. After all, silence was the only thing he had, and with it came the power to imagine something nicer than the falling birds. The glorious silence between cracks of broken sound. The only power over a situation like this. He hated mornings now. Absolutely hated them. M maybe hate is too weak of a word. It had been seven or eight days since Stephen's father had started taking him out of the house more, with these morning hunting trips being one of the lesser stressful events. Samson had failed with one kid before. There wasn't a chance in hell he'd let another one escape his ideals. Especially with Stephen. Leaving such a bright-eyed boy to count strands of cobweb in the attic might be a bit too attractive for local social services to finally catch. Little did he know, Stephen actually preferred counting webs up there, reading books, imagining fantastic scenes of wonder come alive in the dusty air above his bed. Maybe Stephen found a way to bring those scenes with him on these hunts. Or maybe he found peace in the ignorance. But Samson would not let ignorance tune out what few lessons he had to teach the boy. Come on, Stephen, haul him on up. To the barn, Mr. B should be up here soon. Samson raggedly commanded, swinging the gun strap onto his shoulder and most likely interrupting Stephen's break from reality. This week's time was long enough to get into the groove. Grab it and go. Simple as that. No need to speak up to a man with a weapon. The crusty wheelbarrow was a few steps behind him, as lifeless in the dirt and the dust as the pile of goose feather on the ground. He was prepared this time. Not a word, Stephen. Just wheel. He had forgotten the wheelbarrow on the first two morning hunts. Such a scornful father wasn't worth forgetting it a third time. Two and a half hours worth of morning dew mixed in with the dirt kicked up from the wind, and his bare upper body was a bit darker than usual. 
covering the areas not already hidden by the one suspender that still hooked. Yes, father. Stephen heaved the heavy wooden cart up and propped it to a vertical halt. The dirty handlebars left their mark, piercing into Stephen's young, chapped skin. Blisters and splinters, his only merit badges earned after this week-long torture. The carriage took these poor feathered souls to the afterlife, a gondola crossing River Styx with the boy as its doleful gondolier. A spiny cough struggled its way out of Stephen's throat, as it did every eight o'clock hour. Strident coughs always filled the dead silence the ducks and the geese would leave behind. Stephen hated the dust. It seems hate was just the right word this time. The more he noticed the drifting filth, the more it attacked his vulnerable lungs. And the cough would never come alone. It always brought friends. A systematic roll of constant, scratchy hacking freed itself from deep within the eleven-year-old's lungs. To try and shackle them and keep them captive would only bring more pain. And then there's always the fear that the wheat cart would collapse from this turbulence, spilling dead duck all over the bumpy path. Maybe another lucky ride, Stephen thought to himself as a sigh of relief and desperation snuck out between more coughs shouting freedom as they breathed their first breath of new air. Then he leaned against the wooden walls of the decaying barn, defeating the encore with a deep breath of his own. A stretching parade of more dust made its way along the front of the yard, followed soon after by the distant roar of an engine, just when he thought he was clear of it all. A large, shiny black box on white-walled wheels slowed to a stop a few meters from the dirty white fence perimeter enclosing the gray house. As he took a few steps from the barn to his home, Stephen saw a familiar figure exit out of the driver's side door. A slender, suited man of his mid-forties took long strides up to the fence gate. His dark gray blazer held a pressed white dress shirt, the cleanest white of all 18 acres here, dark brown pants below that, with an immaculate crease down the center of each leg. Polished black dress shoes began to lose their gleam with every crusty step along the path to the door. In his left hand, he gripped a black briefcase. In his right, a lighter gray hat and a wave. Stephen had beaten the man to the front door of the house with a quick hurdle over the short end of the fence. The man used the gate. Mr. Brecken, you made it, Stephen called out, waiting for the man to reach the steps up to the door. A good day to you, Mr. Grixon. A very good day for learning, the man answered, which brought a curled smirk to the boy's lip, followed by another sharp cough. So the curious youngster hurled question after question to the wizard who sat before him, elevated behind a large boulder with a name tag on it, could that be the wizard's name? The boulders seemed to serve as some sort of desk for the wizard to write on. Patience, young lad. The wizard spoke in some different language. Today's lesson will consist of grammar, spelling, and reading, Mr. Brecken introduced, taking out two crisp sets of notes and a new textbook. None of this looked like it belonged in such a house. Stephen just sighed and opened up his notebook. His mentor could obviously see the boy longed for lessons of the more extraordinary. Mr. Harold Q. Brecken had been Stephen's at-home teacher for at least one and a half years. He would come every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to teach Stephen language arts and basic mathematics. He was tall, even in the shorter seat across the table in the attic. Stephen was still struggling to meet him at eye level. Proper dress and proper etiquette was everyday routine for him, but he reluctantly followed suit to set an example for the boy. Stephen was still wearing his hunting suspenders and dirt. He always thought Mr. Brecken looked quite different without his hat. His pattern of baldness was similar to his father's, but a little less extreme, and not having a raggedy crusted beard beneath it all helped the boy maintain some focus on his studies. However, Stephen could never quite picture Mr. Brecken without those dark, thick-rimmed tortoiseshell-style glasses. As they sat at the desk in the corner of Stephen's room, Mr. Brecken began to notice a pattern as well. Samson and Maylene, or Mr. and Mrs. Grixon rather, paid good, hard-earned farm money on these lessons, and yet, the only amount of attention Stephen had paid Mr. Brecken in return was during the usual Thursday fantasy literature lessons. He had developed a knack to lose focus on any other thing, and often the teacher caught the student mid-daydream or even mid-head nod, 
Once, Mr. B had even caught, uh, literally caught, Stephen's sleeping, full nodding head before it came two inches to slamming into the desk. Stephen, please, pay attention. Brecken's wide berth of the proper use of apostrophes was halted, catching Stephen with his head half out the window, staring at clouds. We agreed having the table this close to the sill would improve your focus. Now, please, tell me again when not to use an apostrophe. They were already halfway through today's lesson. Hey, uh, that one kind of looks like a dog. And just like that, Hope was out there too, floating amongst the clouds. And doesn't that one look like our barn? Mr. Brecken couldn't help but glance up at the clouds as well. He placed the textbook down, moist thumb along the spine, careful not to lose his spot, and returned his eyes to his student. Okay then, I suppose right now would be a great time as any for a short break. Stephen's attention was moved towards Mr. Brecken now, and just as suddenly, his head began to overflow with curiosity. Uh, Mr. B, Stephen called. Yes, Stephen? What's the city like? Tough one, even for a downtown-based man like himself. Brecken had spoke very little about the city in all of the two short semesters spent visiting the Grickson family farm. The only clues the city gave the boy were the cars and trucks that stopped shortly in front of the barn, or just outside the fence, to trade or purchase goods. More importantly, Stephen's mother and father had instructed that Mr. Brecken's presence in the house was solely for the purpose of teaching their child the proper reading, writing, and simple math skills. That's it. And not to tell the child anything about Falfanex, the only major city 12 miles northeast, or anything really of the goings-on of the world. Even basic American history was off-limits here. <clears throat> Mr. Brecken cleared his throat and tried to change the subject. Uh, I think that one looks like a bird he said, returning to the clouds, keeping all mental focus on the boy's studies. Stephen's curiosity didn't budge. Someday, I'm gonna go to the city. I'm so sick of my life here. I, I want to get out of here before I rot away from my boredom. I wish I could fly to the city, like the clouds, or even the birds. Well, no, not the birds. They, they don't fly too long. That long. Mm-hmm. What? They don't fly that long, or very long. They don't fly very long, or just long. They don't fly long. We're here to learn English, Stephen. Pay attention. Oh, yeah, right. Forgot about the English and things. Stephen was very lucky that his father or his mother were both not in the house to hear that. Lessons unlearned is money lost. A few sharp coughs escaped under his breath. <coughs> Still got quite a cough, do you? <laughs> eh. It's nothing to keep me down. Brecken hoped so. Hmm, right. Well, let's get back to apostrophe, Stephen. Ha <laughs> yeah, the commas, but, but commas that can fly, right? <sighs> Mr. B sighed. All right, let's move to spelling. You taught my brother, didn't you, Mr. B? The teacher swallowed hard and tried to come up with something fast. Maybe he could answer this one off-topic, off-limits question. Just this one. He took a quick glance out the window, down, out, left, and right, and then he spotted Mr. Grixon, busy tending to the herd below, and the shallow scrape of broom fibers signaled that the missus was busy sweeping the porch. Your... your brother? Uh, maybe I did. <laughs> ah, yeah, y yes. A few years, uh, just a few, right before he left to take on a more focused version of the schooling. Focused? Ain't that always what you say I need? Then why not just send me where he went? Mr. Brecken could not say where or why, just how. That's all Samson's pay allowed. I'm sure he's doing fine, Stephen. A deafening crash was heard from the inner walls of the cavern, and then a booming roar. The barbarian clenched his blade tighter. He readied his shield to his chest and he assumed a sturdy stack to face what may be his death. But he stared straight into the beast's eyes. Schooling would usually be over completely by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but not without the usual Thursday fantasy book readings. Following that, Stephen would be given a few short chores to complete in the early hours of evening. Those two hours seemed to last forever most days. A few short barn tasks. Eggs, milk, 
maybe some hay or straightening up tools. But lately, Samson took to the barn work, leaving Stephen easier tasks such as cleaning the house or helping his mother prepare dinner. Tonight's dinner would be a little different than the usual Thursday night potato. This night, the family would feast on the duck that Stephen had seen shot dead earlier in the morning. And luckily for him, his mother would take care of preparing the duck when Stephen's eyes were away from the kitchen. But he would always manage to sneak in a saddened peek or two. Maylene had become very protective of her last remaining child ever since the sudden departure of her firstborn son, Jonathan, who was now around 21 years of age and nowhere to be found. Stephen had always loved his older brother, and being without him has made for the toughest three years of his young life. He was then sent to set the table as his mother put the finishing touches on dinner. Go on now, Stephen. Make sure there's three plates out. Of course there's three, Mom, Stephen remarked. Why would we have more? Maylene cleared her throat. <coughs> uh, right, uh, why would we? Oh, and Stevie, try not to cough too much on the plates, okay, hun? Cover your mouth with your sleeve, at least. Stephen was out of the old overall suspenders and in a long sleeve t-shirt and pants now. It was a bit easier to be discreet with his painful coughs. Every once in a while, he would manage a quick glimpse out the screen door to see his father having his usual pre-dinner smoke. The stars were starting to reveal themselves as the sun hit the horizon hard. Maybe his dad always did this because he liked looking at the sunset. Or maybe he just liked seeing the stars as they all showed themselves one by one across the darkening sky. At least Stephen liked to think that this was the case. Maybe dad just needed to smoke. A sudden clash emanated from near the dining room. The front door was flung open, revealing a more perturbed than usual Samson passing through the main entrance and into the kitchen. The commotion startled the young boy, and his cautious eyes watched as Samson advanced towards Maylene. Are they going to fight again? Stephen thought, but his mother did not even flinch. Samson simply moved his mouth close to Maylene's ear and whispered. But not a word was heard by their son. All he could see was his mother's eyes gaping wide to near-perfect circles. The mighty source was of lightning heaved her staff upward, releasing a blinding surge of charged magic lightning through it as she deftly struck the ground. Tremor after tremor shifted the earth beneath them, and spires of rock and boulders were released hundreds of feet in the air, arching straight into the path of the mysterious wooden man. She had delivered the final blow. <laughs> 